Good afternoon. Hello, uh, I'm Danny Kruger. I am the uh, MP for Devices and I'm the chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group for Dying Well, which is hosting this seminar. And very, very pleased to see so many people join us today. I think this is the best attended meeting we've had yet, um, which I'm very pleased about and reflects the importance of this aspect of the uh, of the agenda and the debate around uh, the potential uh, legalization of assisted suicide. Um, so I'm very pleased today to be able to hand over in a moment to uh, to Jane Campbell, who's going to uh, open the meeting and introduce our, our panelists. Uh, Jane uh, Campbell, DBE, uh, is known as one of the most powerful leaders of the modern disability movement. Uh, she's uh, she had a 40 year career campaigning for the rights of disabled people, uh, especially through parliamentary engagement in the field of equality and human rights legislation. She's set up very, she had a, a number of disability organisations, including the National Centre for Independent Living and Not Dead Yet UK. And since joining the House of Lords in 2007 as an independent crossbench peer, Jane has played key roles in securing a range of legislative rights in health and social care, employment and access to justice. Uh, she's also effectively fought off three private members' bills to legalise assisted suicide. Uh, so we're in good hands. I'm, I'm very uh, excited to, that she's going to be running uh, this meeting today. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and to me, this reflects the absolute central importance of the rights of disabled people in this debate. And I'm very, very keen that we keep them front and centre in the, in the debate that we're going to be having in Parliament in the months ahead. And she's got a great lineup of speakers as well uh, to, to hear from. Um, so, Jane, I'm gonna, I hope you can be promoted to the panel. Otherwise, it's just me. Uh, I hope that's about to happen. And, um, uh, and you're going to uh, introduce Peter and the first speaker. Thank you, Danny. Um, and yes, I am the old. I have thought of many, many bills um, and selected committees, and I've also been in the High Court on this issue. So uh, I guess you can call me an old hand. But I'm here tonight and welcome everybody. I believe there are over a hundred people zooming into the seminar which I'm delighted to um, take you through now. And I'm going to introduce you to three disabled speakers. Two members are um, members of Not Dead Yet. And we have a visiting guest who intuitively supports assisted suicide, but does not support the Baroness Beecher's assisted dying bill. And I hope that between us, we'll give all parliamentarians a much broader understanding of the potential consequences of passing this bill. Um, so let me begin by explaining the background to uh, the Not Dead Yet UK campaign against changing the current law on assisted suicide. I founded the organisation in 2004 when my colleague and my good friend, Lord Joffey, introduced the first assisted suicide private members bill into Parliament. Suicide is not, a, suicide is not illegal, so therefore it seemed perfectly logical to me to offer those who could not commit suicide for reasons of disability the means to do so. For example, in the same way that I have assistance to eat, to breathe and to work. But of course, logic doesn't provide all the answers. And I was soon persuaded to change my mind by increasing numbers of disabled people who contacted me expressing their fears about the bill's unintended consequences. They felt that it would simply 
amplifies society's commonly held belief that sick and disabled people's lives were tragic and not worth living. And this was built, this was really borne out by the media. They believe that as an unintended consequence of assisting us to die, alternatives such as investing in palliative care and support for living would come second, secondary. And it, it would be much easier and cheaper to assist us on our way. So I began to research the issue, both nationally and internationally, to see what the evidence said. The evidence was very important to me. Unfortunately, it confirmed this fear. Individuals identified by the legislation as being the potential beneficiaries of an assisted death were not receiving the same equal rights to live with dignity and respect in all the jurisdictions that I looked at at the time where it was legal. So I concluded that to change the law was far too dangerous without greater state investment in support to in support to live, but not only live or survive, but to thrive without pain and with dignity. To that end, I convened an open meeting open to all disabled people and those who may be seen as beneficiaries of legalizing assisted dying and basically ask them one question. What do you want to do? And on that day, Not Dead Yet UK was born. Our slogan is to assist us to live first. To live with full access to palliative care and support to thrive before devising ways to assist us to die. Only then will we have a real choice to make. Today, NDYUK is a growing network of disabled and terminally ill people who have been instrumental in defeating attempts to legalise assisted suicide in the UK until we find and we really feel safe and secure in the thought that we will receive good alternatives, good social care support, good palliative care support. That has to be first. There are no organisations in this country of or for disabled and terminally ill people to actively campaign for the law on assisted suicide to be changed. Doesn't that tell you something? 12 disability organisations have recently signed up to our campaign against the Baroness Beaches Bill. More are expected to follow. We respect and we understand so well from our own experience, why some individual disabled and terminally ill people want the right for someone to assist them to end their life. But contrary to popular public belief, this is not the general view, view held by the majority of people with lived experience of progressive medical conditions. They tell me until such time as disabled and terminally ill people have enough support to thrive with dignity in society, we cannot contemplate a bill that has the opposite effect. So let's give you some real data and evidence. I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker. Peter and I became friends after I watched his documentary on Channel 4 last year. Dr. Peter Scott Morgan is a polymath 
who earns the first robotics PhD in the UK. He is acknowledged as the world expert in the unwritten rules that drive civilization and currently leads an international team pioneering the application of cutting edge artificial intelligence to extreme disability. I think your mind will be blown. Over to you, Peter. Jane, it's Danny. I think we're just going to, I'm just trying to speak to the office and see what's going on with the audio. So give me one second. Shall we go to the next speaker while you're looking why don't, why, don't, why don't we do that? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I will bring them in. Okay. So until we can find Peter's voice, um, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Miro Griffiths. MBA, and he's a research fellow in disability studies at the University of Leeds. He has written and published extensively on disability policy issues, and he is an advisor to the UK Department of Health and Social Care, the European Commission, and current member of the Equality and Human Rights Commission Disability Committee. Miro. Thank you, uh, Jane, and uh, hello, everybody. Hopefully, you can hear me. Um, if we can load my slides up, that would be helpful. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly for, for 12 minutes around my concerns as a researcher um, and academic on uh, the proposed bill. If we go to the next slide, please. I think an important place to start is with my overall message, uh, which I think can be broken down into three particular areas. Firstly, we need to recognize the context of the situation, and that is disabled people. And by that, I mean, and I am including individuals with health conditions, impairments, illnesses, and so on, experience extensive marginalization and injustice on a daily basis. And that is across the entirety of, of, of the life course. And we can see that with the evidence with regard to accessing services and systems such as healthcare and social care, but we can also see it in relation to things like labor market access and education, which of course are linked to social mobility. And there are widespread restrictions on community participation and opportunities to contribute and have a valued and prominent role in society, which of course, will not only impact the way that we think about ourselves as disabled people and people with impairments and health conditions and question our self-worth and value, but will also affect the way that we think about the importance of services and what we want from services. So recognizing that context, I think it's important to read this uh, assisted dying bill with that in mind. And my argument is that it's, it's not a safe time to be introducing this bill because of the historical legacy of injustice experienced by disabled people, but also because currently we are, we are going through a pandemic which has exacerbated the marginalization experienced by the by disabled people. And as a, as, a, again, as a point to raise to all of us listening here, I suppose the question is, what is the purpose of legislation and policy? And is the purpose, and in my view it is, to provide people with sufficient support to live, to contribute to their communities, to have opportunities to engage and be part of society and participate. So the question is, does this bill, in your, in your views, does this bill, bill provide that opportunity? Does it prompt us down a direction towards uh, sufficient support to live and contribute and thrive? And if it doesn't, is there an ex extended question, which is, does the bill undermine these issues? and these points that have been raised by Jane in the introduction. So to do that, I'm gonna cover a number of different areas. And I want us to think about all these issues in relation to the current bill. Next slide, please. And briefly speaking, I think it's important to recognize that much of disability policy and the legislation around disability has attempted to emphasize that people have impairments and health conditions and illnesses and so on, but the disability comes from the way society is organized. And it comes through 
the, the built environment and it comes through attitudes and it comes through policy implementation. So we need to think about this in relation to the building, understand that much of the concerns raised by communities who are advocating for uh, assisted suicide and assisted dying mechanisms are talking about experiences that are created within society. And surely the emphasis should be placed on trying to remove those barriers when we think about the importance of support, the importance of care, and the importance of participation in society. Next slide, please. And if we think about the current situation facing disabled people, we are aware of how the pandemic, if we just take this as an example, has affected disabled people in relation to their thoughts on healthcare and health professionals and their own ideas and values about themselves as human beings. And if we think about much of the rhetoric around, that surrounds the assisted dying bill, we see emphasis placed on people talking about accessing assisted dying because their life is, is extremely difficult. They're experiencing deep concerns and worries about their life. And of course, in relation to their healthcare and their experience of healthcare. But when we have the latest data that shows us that 35% of disabled people are experiencing uh, affected healthcare, uh, access to healthcare has been affected for 40%. People's overall well being is affected in terms of 65%. And of course, the pandemic itself has created a worsening of people's mental health. And those last two points quarter of disabled people feeling that they are a burden on others, feeling anxiousness for 67%, feeling lonely. And if, when we think about this in relation to why people may choose to go down the route of assisted dying, assisted uh, suicide. We have to acknowledge that this is the context. This is the real situation faced by people with health conditions and impairments. And that is why the bill is unsafe in my view. But let's drill down a little bit further into the bill and think about the current problems and the problematic areas. Next slide, please. And I think a useful way to do this is to, to, to compartmentalize this in five areas. And these are the five areas that I have outlined, which I feel are problematic with the current bill as it stands. And the first area is this issue of individual autonomy and the principal sanctity of life. And the reason I raise that is because we have to recognize that social policy is designed to affect and to instigate change for the entirety of society. And that doesn't dismiss the important voices and views of those who advocate for assisted dying and assisted suicide. But what it does recognize is that we have to base our opinions on the way that legislation should be organized and the way that social policies should be uh, implemented on how they will affect the totality of society, how they will affect our behaviors and our thoughts and principles about certain aspects, and of course, how they will affect the provision of services and the infrastructure around that. So we have to think about how the bill is going to implement uh, mechanisms and procedures which will undoubtedly change and shift the way that we think about healthcare and healthcare professionals. And of course, the importance of sufficient support to exist and be part of your community. And we can see that in particular areas such as the shifting of social attitudes and perspectives. Often the language that is used uh, surrounding the terminology surrounding uh, advocates for assisted dying propose this idea of relieving a burden or relieving stress on families and informal networks. But we've seen this also translated in countries where there is assisted dying and assisted suicide infrastructure. We see examples such as in Oregon where these sorts of, sort of opinions become integrated within medical practice, where we see people being offered assisted suicide because perhaps other treatments and support infrastructure is not available or is not as desirable as this option. We see situations where families have uh, recorded accounts where prof health professionals have raised the option of assisted suicide as a way to spare or relieve the burden on families and individuals. And of course, there is issues here within the, the increasing in cases and the broadening of criteria. And we see that in terms of the increasing numbers, percentages 
of people who are accessing assisted dying and assisted suicide. So it's the creeping effect of increased numbers. The, the peer review data that I've shown you here, 344% increase from 1998 to 2011 in Oregon. If you look at that now, the data from 1999 to 2020, it's an 807% increase in the number of people choosing to die through assisted suicide. And when we look at the reasons why people choose to do this, we see emphasis placed on burden on families and caregivers being cited. We see issues around the ability to participate in enjoyable activities and the fear and the concerns around isolation. And as I've touched on in the previous slides, if this is the current situation for people because of the way that society is organized, surely the emphasis is on changing the way and removing the barriers in society so that people can have enjoyable opportunities as their life progresses and as their needs, health needs change over time. But there's also issues here in terms of uh, concerns around health professionals and the implications that this has for the practitioner, practitioner role. So again, we see the data in Oregon between 2001 and 2007. Of the quarter of the prescriptions written for legal uh, for the lethal uh, drug prescriptions, only three doctors out of 109 were uh, writing the prescriptions. So this shows that there is a problem in the way that, the, that the provision of assisted dying will become concentrated by prominent advocates within the medical professional. And this has major implications then for accountability and transparency. But of course, there's an issue here as well around the conflict of interest. As we know, health professionals are often involved in setting the budgets and determining levels of access to services. So there is a conflict of interest when we think about how social and economic concerns around healthcare intervention may then become incorporated within our perspectives on seeing assisted dying and assisted suicide as a viable option. If I think about my own life as a disabled person, over £100,000 worth of support from healthcare assistance every year. Two weeks medicine treatment is £8,000 for my condition. So there isn't always a, a constant question to judge and value the role of current healthcare procedures. Next slide, please. If we drill down even further, we can start to question aspects of the bill even further. So we have these concerns around the creeping of the inclusion exclusion criteria. And what has always perplexed me is often those who have been campaigning for changes in legislation, those who are advocates for a sitter dying bill who are using their own experiences. I'm not clear on how they would be eligible for the assisted dying under the current offer made in the bill. So surely, as we've seen in other countries, we will see an expansion agenda where those who are not eligible but are currently campaigning will want to have access to this treatment. And we have seen this undoubtedly occur in other countries. And of course, I see there's also a contradiction as well in the bill, in the way that the, the bill dismisses those who have a mental health conditions or uh, or issues of capacity. But if you're arguing that the, the, pro, the prognosis of a terminal illness necessitates this sort of intervention, then how can that, that condition then become irrelevant when it is combined or intersected with other groups who, who may require this or want this? There's also concerns I think about around the, the arbitrary measures. And as we assemble changes in health outcomes, medical technologies, and interventions, we see that it is difficult to, to define when expected death will happen. And the data shows us that there are groups who don't have, uh, who live for longer, even though when there are professional knowledge and out outcomes uh, associated with, the, uh, with predictions of, of death. So even the, the arbitrary measures need to be questioned. And I argue that they are unsafe. And of course the infrastructure issue here in carrying out the due diligence associated with the declarations remains ambiguous. How do we determine the absence of coercion and duress when the Royal College of Psychiatrists and others have argued that it is very difficult to determine and recognize experiences of coercion or duress or even mental health when it, when it becomes entangled with terminal illness? And, my, and again, this point I keep making about how the emphasis is on improving sale people's access to the community, participation in society. So surely we should be emphasizing resources on healthcare and social care and the broader strategies associated with our participation 
And this becomes a way to think about the importance of healthcare as our body changes, rather than attempting to accelerate mechanisms and approaches that will ultimately end with individuals dying. If you go to the last slide, please. This slide, please. So my argument here is that I think the bill remains unsafe as it currently is. I think it is introduced at a dreadful and dangerous time. And we have to acknowledge the context of sale people who are being marginalized in society, exacerbated by the pandemic. And I'll leave you with a final point, which is which has often perplexed me. Often those who support the bills and, and advocates of assisted dying dismiss the concerns by campaigners and organizations and scholars who are against assisted dying bills such as, such as this one. But if the bill is supposed to be coherent and reliable and, and safe, then surely those who are advocates for it should be able to demonstrate how all of our concerns can be addressed through the current ways in which the bill is, is, is being designed within the current procedures of the bill. Because if the concerns that we have raised cannot be addressed within the current iteration of the bill, then surely the bill remains unsafe. And that's where I'll stop. Thank you very much, Miro. That was superb. There is a great deal of data there that we will let people have after the seminar. Uh, we're going to give it another go, so bear with us. Peter Scott Morgan, please speak. Noble and right honourable ladies and gentlemen, I find myself intuitively supporting the assisted dying bill. To me, its intentions appear so obviously reasonable, compassionate, humane. But as a scientist, I'm trained to question even the most obvious, especially the obvious. Because of those most fundamental assumptions, the unquestioned assumptions prove false, then every conclusion based upon them is invalidated, even the reasonable, compassionate, humane ones. So, as part of your due diligence, I invite you to focus on the most fundamental, most unquestioned assumption of this bill. The apparently self-evident truth that, with an untreatable condition, such as late-stage motor neuron disease, MND, with someone diagnosed as being within six months of death, there is no reasonable expectation that the patient can not only survive, but thrive. For many years, with an increasing quality of life, it's a crucial test for me. If that seemingly ludicrous scenario occurred even once, then it would unravel all the reassuring assumptions underpinning my intuitive support for the bill. Everything would be called into question because of confusion about the likelihood, let alone inevitability of intolerable suffering. Concerned that we are not only shortening life by a few months. Worry there are insufficient protections against patients not being fully informed. Uncertainty between being terminal and simply being disabled. Danger that some with extreme disability may unnecessarily kill themselves in an anticipation of what they incorrectly believe will inevitably happen and the ethical risk of protecting an individual's human right to choose to die without putting the same effort, education, and funding into their right to thrive. None of this fundamental unraveling would undermine the bill's basic premise that this is a personal choice, but it unequivocally would undermine the assumption that the choice was fair. I know because this is me. I have late stage MND. In 2017, doctors agreed I might die within six months. Now, I'm almost completely paralyzed, locked in, 
climate crime candidate to be fast tracked for death. But I'll pass on the offer. I'm frankly far too busy having fun. Let me explain how and invite you to decide whether I trigger the criteria for revisiting the assumptions behind the bill. Does what's dubbed the world's cruelest disease nevertheless inevitably suck the joy out of life? Look, I found the trick to enjoying total paralysis is simply to imagine you're in a luxury spa hotel and the maitre d' insisted you put your feet up and you don't move a muscle. It's brilliant. The life of a sedentary pharaoh. I've discovered my inner slob. And no one complains. Even better, paralysis is an engineering challenge, far more than a medical one. And that's something I know a bit about. You see, with MND, the good news is that you'll always be able to go to the loo. The bad news is you'll never be able to get to the loo, or eat, or drink. My solution was to completely replumb my gut and add four new connections. Food in, liquid in, waste number one, waste number two. But it had never been done before. So I booked to see a top surgeon at my local NHS hospital here in Torquay and explained my ideas. After a while, he shook his head and said, of course, we should be offering this on the NHS. A few months later, a trio of him and two other surgeons performed the first ever such operation in the world. Now, I never have to get up at night. I can eat while I'm asleep. And for the first time in my life, I drink over two liters of water a day. For me, it's been a definite upgrade. Now I was guaranteed not to starve to death. There remained a pesty problem of carrying on breathing. Lots of people with MND die of a type of pneumonia caused by saliva getting into their lungs. So I came up with the idea of using an operation designed for throat cancer that detaches your windpipe from your throat so saliva can never get in. It turned out I was the first MND patient the NHS ever did this for. The only downside was I had to sacrifice my voice box. So while I could still speak biologically, I worked with an amazing company in Edinburgh to use artificial intelligence, AI, to clone my voice. This isn't how I'll end up sounding. That'll hopefully be indistinguishable from how I used to speak. But my Peter 2.0 voice already sounds very like original me, and it's beginning to show some of the emotion and emphasis and pauses that define the real me just as much as my voice. I'm planning to use more and more AI to work with me on everything. Everything from speaking to controlling things to moving about. I need AI to second guess what I'm wanting to communicate, to partner with me, like a jazz combo. And yes, that AI, which some of the top tech firms in the world have started researching with me, we get better every year in pace with computer power. That's going to transform my ability to convey the real me, the one inside. A year ago, we set up a charitable research body called the Scott Morgan Foundation to act as the focus for a hugely ambitious research program stretching across decades. And we've been unbelievably lucky in being able to attract some of the world's top brains to get involved. Our mission is to completely rewrite the future of disability. And the beating heart of that mission of the Scott Morgan Foundation is to light an unquenchable beacon of hope for those with extreme disability and so-called terminal conditions to guide them out of the darkness. As a scientist and as a prototype, I'm very optimistic about the power of AI and robotics to transform our expectations of what it means to be old, even in terms of becoming forgetful or getting dementia. We're at the early dawn of escaping the fear of becoming infirm, of being powerless, of being trapped in an inadequate body. My overall quality of life is exceptional. I have love. I have fun. I have hope. I have dreams. I have purpose, 
Oh, and did I mention I'm still alive? I mean, really alive. Not just one of the living dead, not just surviving, thriving. My diagnosis with MND has confirmed to me that joy in life, contentment, happiness, fun are far less a result of circumstances than many assume. They are an act of will. The point is, each of us can find ourselves crushed, simply staying alive. But each of us can also choose to rise like a phoenix and thrive. Whatever we are, whatever our background, whatever our circumstances, whatever our ambitions. Of course, it's scary. But when our response to our clash of hope and fear is nevertheless to deliberately break the rules, rebel against fate, forge our own destiny, then sometimes, impossibly, we get to leave our fingerprints on everyone's future, and we change everything. I want you to meet someone. He's a human phoenix, rising from the ashes of his old body, transformed, reborn. He is also me, the real me, Peter Unleashed. This is who I'm transitioning to. Hello, I'm Peter 2.0. Welcome to the future. Well, thank you very much, Peter. Um, and I think it's really important for me to tell all our viewers that you are the first or one of the first to see Peter's new um, avatar uh, that has, as you can see, all sorts of features to both Peter's voice alive with expression. So thank you very much for that, Peter. Again, I think you must have given all of us some real food for thought as a living example of someone who is really transitioning from the experiences of having an extreme impairment, terminal impairment, as people call it, of MND. So, moving swiftly on, I would like to introduce you to uh, the last speaker today, Phil Friend. Phil has been an active supporter and co-convener with me since 2009. As the organisation got bigger and bigger, I certainly couldn't do it on my own. And Phil has been a great stalwart by my side since then. After a very successful career in social work with children, he set up a consultancy and training company that promotes employment, independent living, and social inclusion programs for and with disabled people. Phil, over to you. Thank you uh, very much, Jane, and thank you everyone else for, for joining us uh, this evening, well, this afternoon. Um, how do you follow the previous two speakers is the challenge for me. And I think in discussion with colleagues about my part of this process, I wanted to talk primarily from a slightly more personal view. Um, just to kick things off, uh, I uh, contracted polio when I was uh, three. I've therefore been disabled for most of my life. And I should explain that as a result of that, I dream in a wheelchair. I do not dream walking. That's not what I do. So um, for me, disability has always played a major role in my life. As a result of that, uh, I've been very fortunate to be uh, born into a country which has a medical care system and other systems in place which enable me to live a very full life. I was born just before the National Health Service was formed. I benefited hugely from the fact that it existed. I was placed in an iron lung because I was completely paralyzed and couldn't breathe. And doctors and other medical professionals did everything they could to ensure that I survived that experience. As a three-year-old, I was then 
received into hospitals where I spent many of my childhood years and then went through a special education, which equipped me, maybe not as adequately it might have done, but this is a long time ago, to deal with the world that I was about to uh, move into. And I think what I'm wanting to remind myself and the listeners to this is that the medical profession plays an absolutely key, crucial and vital role in the lives of all of us, but particularly those of us who have disabilities or long-term health conditions. We are frequent users of their services. And there's no doubt in my mind that without the care and attention I received, I wouldn't be talking to you now. So now what the Meacher Bill does for me and for many disabled people, and I think it's a awesome responsibility to be talking to some degree on their behalf for those that can't be with us this evening. Um, the simple fact of the matter is that the Meacher Bill begins to place some doubts in our minds, and I'm convinced doctors' minds, about what their role is. I've always had, and I think many, many people like myself have always had, a complete and utter faith and trust in doctors and medical professionals. They've always done what they could to enable me to live the fullest life possible. But more recently, and as Jane mentioned, you know, we've been involved in campaigns on and off for a long time now as bills have come and gone to try and change this. My most scary thought is the fact that doctors are now going to be asked to consider ending life rather than saving it. And that, I think, undermines the whole relationship that exists between the patient and the doctor, that it's an option that might be offered. At the moment, it's not an option that could be offered. So we have to search for other ways to do things. The BMA later this year are going to hold another conference where they will discuss this issue and they will be urged, or at least we believe they will be urged, to change their uh, position on the subject of assisted suicide and um, to uh, agree to it. Um, we are really worried about that. We think that the doctors are, the doctors specifically, are the people that uh, protect us from the kind of thoughts that life is not worth living. And I think a quote that I'd like to use from Robert Twyquos, who is a, a palliative care doctor, says something important here. He says, palliative care is based on the belief that life has meaning and purpose up to the moment of death, whereas assisted dying is essentially nihilistic. Expecting health professionals to deliver both palliative care and assisted dying, in other words, to face in two directions simultaneously is too big an ask. So one of the greatest challenges that I believe the Meacher Bill proposes for disabled people is the threat to the relationship we have with doctors and others who look after us. Now, much has been made and Miro talked about it uh, and so did Peter, the idea, the concept of being a burden. And Miro specifically talked about the perceptions of disabled people or disability. And historically, disabled people or disabilities have been seen to be uh, about suffering and pity and hopelessness and tragedy. Uh, these kinds of words are used to describe both disability and disabled people. And over the last 30 or so years, there have been active campaigns to try and shift this view. And some of you will have heard of the social model of disability, which it shifts the emphasis away from the individual more to the uh, discriminations that the individual faces. But there is no doubt in my mind that disabled people are still viewed pitifully. And while that is the case, it's very easy to therefore take a view that it would be easier for this individual to end their lives. After all, it, it can't be uh, successful. They can't hope for futures. They can't aspire to do things. And I would remind all of you that I, as a result of the treatments and processes that I received, I had a very successful career. 
I have four children, I have five grandchildren, I'm still doing very nicely, thank you, and living a life to the full. So this idea that disability is something to be pitted and therefore we should act kindly towards it doesn't cut much ice with me, I have to say. I think on the family front where we're, you know, the idea of the safeguards in the bill, the proposed bill are that, you know, there will be safeguards to protect disabled people. And some of that is based on uh, the notion that uh, we will give our consents and so on and so forth. But I'm reminded that uh, some families are not nice. Some families do not treat their family members well, particularly their disabled well, uh, disabled family members well. And the former Court of Protection judge, Denzel Lush, has estimated that one in eight lasting powers of attorney may involve financial abuse. And according to a 2015 report by Age UK, 50% of financial abuse of elderly people in the UK is perpetrated by adult children. So when we think about the idea of coercion, etc., it's worth reminding ourselves that it's very difficult to understand the dynamics of families and therefore protect the vulnerable or those at most risk from their relatives. So the safeguards that don't address that in my, in my view. There's also the fact that we often feel a burden on society. The recent experiences of COVID have taught us that the resources are scarce, that life or death decisions are made on whether resources are available. Well, as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, I was lucky enough to be placed in an iron lung. And as a result of that, I survived. Uh, I suspect that nowadays, different judgments might be made based on my age and my long lasting condition. So I think that until the state, and I use that term very generally, sees disability as a positive issue rather than a negative one, then continuing judgments will be made, which do not necessarily work in the best interests of disabled people. Um, as I move towards the conclusion, I believe that the safeguards that are currently in place are not safe at all. I believe that Miro pointed this out, that there is evidence that in every, legis in every jurisdiction where assisted suicide currently exists, they have been expanded to cover more and more people. And the uh, increase, huge percentage increases in the numbers of people applying for assisted suicide in those jurisdictions uh, is scary, to put it mildly. So I have just a few comments for the parliamentarians listening to this and who've participated in the conversation this afternoon. And it is this. It is our concern that you should not focus on personal choice or personal morality, but focus on public safety. This has to be the primary consideration in all, legis all legislation. What we want you to do is to help disabled people to thrive, not to die. And finally, if you can go through the voting lobby, for those of you that will, and put your hand on your heart, and be sure that there will be no unintentional deaths as a result of this legislation, please vote for it. But if you can't, then don't. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, I hope between us that we've given all the parliamentarians, noble lords, honourable members, and the many members of the public who've come tonight to listen to us give another view and another context in which this bill needs to be seen. So I'm going to hand over to Danny Kruger now. Um, Danny, thank you for letting me hijack your APPG. Um, I hope that we have done you proud. Um, Jane, thank you so much. Um, you've hijacked it brilliantly, and I'm very pleased and very grateful to all those speakers. They're absolutely tremendous and compelling set of arguments and data. Um, I'm convinced, uh, but I was anyway. So um, I'm very, very grateful to everyone. We've got a few minutes only for questions. So can if we? So if, if we can get everyone promoted to panel again, um, I'm just going to fire a couple of questions if 
at, at them if that's okay. Um, Jane, let me let, let, let me come to you first. And you, in a sense, you've addressed this, but why don't you just try and summarise it in a sentence or two? Um, what safeguards do you think should be in place to make the law safe if it were to pass? How could it be amended to be safe? Uh, this particular bill at this particular time, I'm not sure that there are enough safeguards that can be thought up um, to amend this bill to make it safe for everybody. I feel that having just come out of a pandemic where hundreds of thousands of disabled and terminally ill people um, either lost their lives or had great problems surviving throughout, um, and the fact that we were not given the support to live both health also care-wise, um, I think it's, it's probably in, insensitive to bring this about now. And I think that we need to understand a lot more about what would really happen to disabled and terminally ill in this country on a mass level um, before we start legislating for the odd individual. Okay, Jane, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Myra, can I ask you a question that's come in from Ellen Clifford, um, who's, who's interested in the relationship between the pandemic and what feels like a, go, a global rush towards legalisation. Uh, so Spain, um, Canada, uh, other parts of the UK all, all seem interested in this. Do you relate that to the pandemic? And what do, you, what do you see as the connection, if any? I think it does, because we've seen during the pandemic that much of the emphasis was questioning disabled people's access to health care and questioning the quality of life and existence, particularly by non-disabled communities without the, the voice of disabled people. So I, uh, my argument would be it has been exacerbated by the pandemic, but the historical legacy of social injustice for disabled people and, and inequality has to be acknowledged in this process as well. And when you have had a legacy of campaigning by disabled people's organizations across the globe that have based the majority uh, of their arguments on sufficient support to live, to contribute, to have opportunities in society, surely that should be the emphasis of parliamentarians and policymakers, rather than debating and questioning mechanisms and operations that will accelerate opportunities to, to die. And of course, bring a real problematic situation for the government which, and medical professionals, which is to facilitate death. And I think those questions, whilst they can be debated, they must not overtake the broader arguments by disabled people and their organizations, which is the right to live and the right to thrive and be part of society in a valued uh, position. Mara, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, and then my, my last question for, is for you, Phil, and it's coming from James, who, who, who says, says this, um, that suicide is legal in this country. Uh, he is too, well, I'll read out, I am too dis severely disabled to, to commit suicide without assistance. Uh, if I become terminally ill uh, and I'm suffering intolerably, what, what advice do you have? this for a year and I still forget to unmute. Apologies, James. Um, what I was saying was that I think I'd ask, the first question I'd ask is why is he suffering intolerably? I think that we've got uh, a long way down the road of helping people feel comfortable and at peace in a sense with the, at the end of their lives. So that's my first response. But I think the second is that I uh, don't believe that allowing the Suicide Act to be extended to include assistance to die um, necessarily helps the majority. It argues against providing good services at the end of life because it's cheaper and quicker to end it. And we've got evidence from a number of economic papers that suggest that one of the big pushes is that long-term care costs a lot of money, whereas of course assisted suicide drugs don't. So for me, it's not about personal issues. I do recognize that many people suffer or feel they, they may suffer and want to do something about that and take control over their lives. But I think that puts the rest of us at jeopardy and that's why we take the position we do. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Jane, 
last word for you. Do you want, is there anything you'd like to say, particularly about the process of the bill? Uh, we're now expecting it to come to your house in early September. Um, what, what would you like people to do between now and then? I would like people to be informed. I would like them to not think of this issue from their own experiences or fears of what might happen to them at the end of life or what has happened to a loved one. Um, my, hus- my first husband died from HIV, from contaminated blood pro- products. It was the worst five years of my life. And if I took that one experience and said, this is the reason why I would have liked to give him assistance to die, but it was extremely difficult at the end of his life, I would know that that would be wrong, because it will affect thousands of others negatively. This cannot be seen as an individual matter. You must look at the public safety issues and look at the evidence. Look at the evidence. Jane, thank you very much. Um, Very, very powerful. I hope you also give the practical advice to people who are watching to write to their uh, right to parliamentarians. That's what we we hope people will do over the next few months. Uh, to Absolutely. Yes, um, I, I, I would ask all people, especially those with the lived experience of a terminal condition or a progressive disability, to write in and say exactly why you might be afraid or otherwise. Jane, thank you so much. And my thanks to everybody who's, all, all, all our speakers and everyone who's taken part. Um, it would be great if people could uh, could contact their MPs or peers. Um, the APPG uh, website has a whole host of useful resources and material and, and information. That's dyingwell.co.uk. Please follow us on Twitter at dyingwellappg. And do get in touch uh, with, with my office through, through Parliamentary Switchboard or Jane's uh, if you'd like to get involved or for more information. I'm extremely grateful. We're going to close the meeting there. I would very much appreciate it if parliamentarians could stay on because we're going to have a quick election, which will take 30 seconds to appoint some new officers to the APPG. But the public part of this meeting is now closed. And my very, very many sincere thanks to all of our participants. Thank you all very much indeed. <laughs>